going to ask uh, Dr. Barrett Hatches to come up. Um, and I won't repeat myself about bio. You've heard that, that comment. But uh, I'm going to ask him to come up and uh, kick off the rest of our program. Well, thank you, and uh, it's good to be back home. <laughs> for those of you who have been involved with this project for over a year, and I've had the privilege of working with you, it's good to be here and, and uh, watch the unveiling here. It's certainly wonderful news that uh, Chet rolled out earlier. Uh, always good to have the commitment and support of the Congresswoman uh, leading us here. And I just want to thank uh, all of you who've participated in this process uh, for a long time, and I hope you feel as good and as proud of the work uh, that you have in front of you today as I do. And, but, but the most important part now is moving forward. Uh, we're fortunate today to have uh, some of the people in the room that we all talked about as we were going <laughs> through these discussions uh, in the sense that it would be interesting to know uh, their perspective. And uh, I think what we're going to, to do here today will sort of at, start to answering those questions for us and uh, help us move uh, in, the, uh, in the direction that we're all uh, very interested in getting to. So because we have an hour and we have uh, leaders on this panel, uh, I'm going to ask that uh, uh, you, know, you, you sort of hit that question and, and move on. Because uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a really nice guy, and it's hard for me to say stop. Uh, but, but we're going to make sure that everyone gets an opportunity uh, to respond and participate in this process. Uh, I want you to know right up front, you may not get an opportunity to answer every question, uh, and I'm sure you're okay with that. Uh, some, of these questions, <laughs> some of these questions I think uh, all of you are going to get an opportunity to, to respond to. So let's just start out by me first introducing. I'm sure everyone in, in the room knows you, so I'm, I'm not going through your bio. I'm just going to mention you by name and position and, uh, and the organization that you represent. We're going to start uh, with Bob. Uh, well, I call him Bob. I think everybody calls him Bob, right? Mm -hmm. Robert on the front end, who is uh, Executive Director of CARES. And then next to him is Robin Afram, who is the CEO of Community Care Health Centers. And next to Robin is, uh, they switched seats on me, but Dr. Claire uh, <laughs> Pomeroy, who is the CEO uh, of UC Davis Health System. Next to Claire, uh, everyone knows Jim Ellsworth, who's the interim CEO of Capital Community uh, Health Network. Next to Jim is Ron Groper, who's Senior Vice President and Area Manager of Kaiser Permanente. Next to Ron is Kevin Vasari, who is President of uh, Woodland Healthcare, a Dignity Health member. And I just want to say this about Kevin right now. He has a real hard commitment after this, and he's going to have to leave it at 3 o'clock. And I want you to know that now, so if he gets up at 3 o'clock and leave, I want anybody to think he's mad. <laughs> and we want to make sure he gets a chance to, uh, to say uh, a lot before he leaves here. And then next to uh, uh, Kevin is carry on pleats. You got it right. Congratulations. Hey, how about that? Thanks to Abe. He was really concerned, too, that I'd mess this all up. Uh, who is CEO of Sutter Homes uh, Health Sacramento uh, Sierra Region. Let's get right into it. And the first thing I want to do, I want to give everyone an opportunity to participate in this question. You have, um, you've seen the, the presentations here today. You've seen a lot of data before. You certainly have had an opportunity to be familiar with uh, the market analysis and the strategic plan. And I'd just like to get your reactions to what you've seen so far. So if you would, we'll just start on the end and work our way across this panel and just take a couple of minutes, I mean literally two minutes, <laughs> and just, just respond to what you've seen so far. Bob? Uh, my first reaction is uh, we as a community and health systems, cl clinics have got a lot of work to do for sure. There's no doubt about it. And because uh, I come from a, a clinic that is a very close collaborative relationship with the four hospital systems. They're all my bosses. They sit on the board, or they have, so we're very close to them. And I, I think about that collaboration, and in the specialty area, which is HIV, which CARES is currently uh, involved in, how do I take that as a leader of a community clinic and expand it to a broader population? We are a patient-centered medical home. We've been recognized it, so how do I open this particular model that has been so effective in HIV care, specialty care, 
and make it broader and how can we afford to do it is a big part of it. So as I think about this is how do I bring more primary care into the general population, use that same model and do it effectively. That's, that's what I think about. Um, yeah, I thought, well, I think that's a good start and we have a long way to go actually was actually my reaction. Um, and um, I, th I thought that it, it actually brought up enormous opportunities. I, I was thinking, okay, well, what does this really mean? Particularly for us in Yolo County. We, um, we don't always look at ourselves as participants in a regional collaboration. And when, when I say that, it's, it's this region. It's Yolo, Sacramento, El Dorado, and Placer. Geographically, it makes sense, but we don't always collaborate that way. And so that's, it's, that's gonna be a really, that's a new thing and actually I think a really good thing because the patterns of the people that use our services, it is Sacramento, YOLO and to, to a, a large extent, particularly West Sacramento for us. And so I think there's, there's um, opportunities there and it, that's gonna take a lot of work. What I also thought of is that we do collaborate a lot but we collaborate in our county and we, and we as community care health centers collaborate individually with other community health centers and with other partners. We, co we collaborate a lot with the four healthcare systems, but as community care health centers, and we collaborate with other community health centers. I mean, CARE is just one of them. Um, so that, that's gonna be a change to look at the whole region to collaborate that way. For us, it's really gonna be, it's, it's different, it's new. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. Uh, I think my first reaction was um, a combination of hope and excitement. Um, a lot of gratitude to how much work everybody put into this process. Um, but my second reaction was, it's about time. I mean, we have patients out there who aren't getting services. And that's really unconscionable in a community like ours. And so how are we gonna to come together? How are we going to think in new ways? And, and, and my reaction to this is this is really a blueprint. This is a blueprint for thinking about new places to deliver care, new people to deliver care, and new types of programs that are desperately needed if we're really gonna get to better health for all, if we're really gonna talk about reducing health disparities, if we're really going to talk about some social justice in the health care that we deliver in this community. So um, I am overall excited about the possibility of defining a new way, a better way. I hope we don't forget as we have these conversations about the patients. There was a lot in here about providers. There was a lot in here about money. And what I don't want to lose is these are lives. These are people with families and friends and aspirations for the future. And that's really what healthcare is about, giving them the opportunity to get those things. Thank you. Jim? Um, yes, thank you. I, I had three initial reactions. First, I, um, I found that it really validated what every one of us in this room knows in some Part, and it does so in a comprehensive way. And that's uh, a good thing to have, finally, uh, a comprehensive picture of what we're dealing with. Um, the second reaction that I had was that, uh, again, in this room, there is a huge readiness for the change and the building that needs to go on. And uh, the third thing that I thought to myself was, here is an opportunity to address some of the real structural impediments to that change. And I'm going to look at Congresswoman Dor Doris Matsui and say, uh, there are things that need to change that can't be done by the people up here. It has to be done by lawmakers. Uh, and uh, I'd be prepared to talk about those as we answer more questions. Good, thanks, Jan. Ron? 
I was experiencing all of the emotions that, and one good thing about being at this end of the table, you have very eloquent people <laughs> that can express a lot of what you said. So, but we're going to switch that up later. <laughs> <laughs> you know, by the time you get to me, you kind of wonder about what clever thing you could say. Uh, here was my thought, though. I was somewhat astounded when I saw the map and I saw the quantity of people that are going to be impacted. And being a practical individual, I immediately kind of started thinking about how. A lot of facts and a lot of figures today, a lot of information that got presented. And I started to think through, you know, I work for Kaiser. And Kaiser is great at its integrated model. It's great at its preventative care. But how are we going to translate that experience now into this mass of population out there? And what is my role and my responsibility and my organization's role and responsibility within that greater context? Good. Thank you. Ken? So uh, my reaction was to uh, look at uh, the report and see what I can do practically out of it uh, that uh, I can implement locally, act. Uh, locally and think globally. Uh, what I saw in there was really encouraging because there were some practical things uh, around care management which uh, we can put to use and I'll share some of those experiences from uh, Yolo County such as uh, the joint operating committee that we've put together with uh, the FQHCs and with the county to ensure that the patients the morning after an ED visit uh, can get in and can get access to a PCP or a specialist. Uh, there also uh, was in the report an acknowledgement of leadership, uh, coordinated leadership, never mind the care, coordinated leadership. Rewind four years or so, uh, the county had budgetary issues with its indigent program, the white chip program in YOLO, and they were making decisions in their own silo to manage that budget, and FQHCs were faced with the same issue and changing uh, PCP coverage, and we uh, were doing the same at Woodland Healthcare. So each of us making those decisions in separation was sub-optimizing the whole and was causing lose-lose for all of us and ultimately for the patient. So I think coordinated leadership uh, and uh, uh, care coordination are the two areas that uh, I wanted to shine the light on and uh, was very, very encouraged to see that in the report. The one thing that we cannot act locally on in Woodland Healthcare is we're on a IT system that is different from the other major systems. And if we're going to have transportability of patients, we've got to find a way around that. And the other one is specialty care is as significant, if not more so, than PCP. Um, and so uh, we don't have the services in Woodland. So I can. Uh, wish to, to act locally as much as possible, but it's ultimately going to come to this kind of a forum to say what's going to happen to a pediatric oncology case that Woodland cannot handle. So I was very encouraged to see that get amplified because some things are not uh, possible to act on locally, right. IT and uh, major specialty cases. Right, right, exactly. Thank you. And since I'm the last, you know, I'll just say ditto. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> You know, first, I think it's uh, Claire said it very well. I think it's optimism. You've got everybody in this room. You've got wonderful leadership. I see the, the county, many providers represented, represented here. Congresswoman Matsui, it's great to see you again. Um, and all of us up here, um, some of us have been here for a while, um, so just to, to be frank. And we've got some great <coughs> best practices that we have done really well in this county and great examples of how we've all partnered very well in building upon those. Um, but we are just in the infancy stages. And many other counties have really been able to figure this out. Um, and it's great to acknowledge that we don't have to create this in a vacuum. And so using all of the great work that's already been done, all of the partnership, the leadership, um, with the optimism, we'll get to where we need to be. So hopefully five years from now, we'll look back and say we're the best practice that's out there. So I'm looking forward to that. Good. Thank you so much for your initial comments. Now, now let's take for a minute the, uh, not just what you've seen here tonight, but also your understanding of the Affordable Care Act and what it's going to mean. Uh, and, and so this is not the first conversation you've had about this. So <laughs> just talk a little bit about um, what your organizations are doing now to prepare 
for the Affordable Care Act 2014? And just as importantly, uh, what kinds of uh, uh, changes do you think you're going to need to make and what are you going to have to prepare for based on now this market analysis that you've seen? So prior to this data, you had some vision for what 2014 would mean. So talk about how you prepare for that vision and then a step, a step for, for, uh, forward. Now that you have this information, what kind of things are you doing? And let's start with you, Ms. Yeah, Brown. I thought you might be looking at me for the greatest inning at the end. So I think you want a good we role were, here. We were just commenting, how many days do you have? Um, so, uh, you know, I, really short on the ACA. Um, conceptually, it's absolutely the right thing to do. Get more people access to the right level of care and get it into a primary care um, situation instead of being episodic the way it's currently structured. I'm fully supportive of um, concept. Um, well, what we're doing to prepare for it is really the clarity is we're going to have expanded access, more people coming in through our doors, and we're going to be paid a heck of a lot less. Um, so how do you fundamentally, the era of, and I'm speaking from a hospital hat, the era of the typical cost-cutting measures in hospitals just is just not going to get there. You just have to fundamentally look at completely redesigning what we have been historically knowing and operating and been educated upon for the past 50 years, frankly. So how do you do it in 18 months or less? Um, so total cost of care, accountability, setting the right incentives in the right place, and it goes again back to, I really appreciate what Claire just said, it's all about the patient. And so even though it's extremely complex, lots of changes, if it's patient first always, we'll end up in the right place. Thank you. Bob? One ready, right? No dittos anymore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, certainly, what what is uh, you know, uh, CARES doing? Uh, we have a capacity issue, a facility issue that uh, just we're about growing our facility. It is a real challenge. Um, we. Um, we have a provider issue, lack of providers, uh, given what I see coming through the door in the very near future. Uh, I was, just real quickly, I was talking earlier with, with Claire about it. Uh, we see two populations now. We see an HIV positive population. And several years ago, we, we took on opening our doors to be an STD uh, testing and care. And so these are all HIV negative, entirely different populations and they walk in, it's a walk-in clinic, whatever. And, as I was, and what I'm envisioning is I can walk into the reception area, I see one of our HIV positive people, I say, who's your primary care provider? They can tell me. They're getting good care, they, they are getting what they need. One of these STD walk-in clients, I walk, I say, who's your primary care provider? They don't have one. It's as if we're being used as emergency room for STDs, that's kind of, so how do we get to the point where everyone that walks in a clinic can name their primary care provider? I think when we get to that point, we'll have reduced the cost of care and we'll have achieved the goals of the Affordable Care Act. That's where I think we need to go. And that's what we're trying to do. But how quickly we can get there as a clinic, as CARES, yeah, it's gonna be a very, very quick race to try and get there. Dr. Palmer? I think it's important to remember that the ACA is really about insurance reform. It gives people access, but it is not so much about how do we fundamentally redesign the ways in which we give care. There's some parts, PCORI, et cetera, that are in there, but I think what we have to ask ourselves is, as all of these new patients come and we celebrate the fact that they have access, how are we gonna redesign our services so that we really are talking about prevention. We really are talking about what's so important to Sierra Health Foundation here, addressing the social determinants of health. We really need to ask ourselves, how are we gonna move from a hospital-based system to one that is much more out in the community, in the schools, in the homes? How are we gonna empower patients to take responsibility for their own health? These, these are fundamental redesign questions that um, right now are very difficult to accomplish because right now today, the incentives are to continue doing things the old way. 
as I've said before, right now the incentives are for me to buy the hospital another PET scan and do a whole bunch of imaging. They, the incentives right now are not to put in a wellness program or not to go out and partner with the schools to increase um, uh, uh, health literacy. So as we are going to have to figure out how to make that transition to the things that are truly going to improve health outcomes because the only way you bend the health cost curve is to do things in a different way. Great. Thank you so much, Kevin. Well, I, I think uh, ACA is going to fundamentally change everything. We do. Uh, I'll give you an example. Woodland Healthcare is an integrated campus. We have over 100 physicians and providers. Um, we're asking them more and more to keep patients out of the hospital and, in fact, out of their clinic. Hmm. I thought we were doing wellness and prevention. You're keeping them out of the clinic, so how are they going to get the care? So patient portal, more and more being done on the net where they ping the physician with a question. Uh, or they uh, uh, hear back from the physician that you're up for something or make sure you check this. Just the other day, uh, we had a meeting with a company that's uh, toying with uh, GPS uh, and Wi-Fi um, enabled um, um, pressure cups, scales, and so on and so forth. So actually that information is uploaded into the EMR at Woodland Healthcare and that way the physician can see the progress the patient's making between visits to say, hey, your pedometer said, we agreed, you take a thousand steps each day and you're down again, what's okay. going on? So uh, those are just some examples, but uh, all that takes time. So how will the physician get compensated for the work he did or the work he didn't do in the office? Um, that's a very fundamental shift, not only for the medical center, Woodland Healthcare in this case, uh, but also for the physician. So the areas we're investing in are radical redesign of uh, work that does need to be done in the office, uh, whereby the physicians, if we were lucky to find enough primary care physicians to hire them, uh, but we're not, uh, and we're actively recruiting to the extent we cannot scale ourselves, uh, we're looking at um, uh, team care where a physician is matched up with a nurse practitioner, a PA, possibly two MAs, and uh, an RN, which is not usual to find a lot of RNs in PCP settings in their offices. This would allow uh, the physician to be relieved from doing much of the work, particularly for the chronic issues of their patients. That work would be done with others, and um, that would help uh, enhance our capacity. So that's one thing we're doing, of course, in addition to uh, bricks and sticks that we do need to expand in the ambulatory setting to house these providers in a different kind of a configuration, but all that goes hand in hand. Good. Thank you. And, and I know, Kevin, you're going to have to leave in a minute, so let me start the, the next question with you. Um, one of the things uh, certainly that you saw in this presentation today uh, that came out of the work over the last year is this discussion around collaboration and the need to collaborate. Um, and, and all of you do that within your hospital settings, within and without, also uh, same thing with, on the clinic side. Uh, this, this is the question though. Uh, if there was a group formed to sort of look at policy and program strategies around uh, the issues of the region as, as they have been identified, uh, what would that group look like and uh, who should be involved? Let's start with you, Kevin. Well, um, I'd say uh, the medical directors from each of the organizations involved would have a key voice in, uh, in, in this governance uh, situation because you need to identify the 80-20, which conditions, which diseases are really eating up uh, and consuming the dollars or needing uh, uh, more access. Um, so I would definitely in include uh, the medical directors. The second is we need the finance type of people because there's so much claims data uh, that we're not getting, whether it's pharmacy utilization or um, it is inpatient or outpatient utilization. So we would need to have the finance types. Uh, we need to have the clinical uh, types. I would say those are two uh, primary ones. Of course, you need to have people from uh, from operations. Uh, for uh, best practice, I think we need to have best practice. I'll just give you one example. 
uh, of best practice. Uh, at Woodland Healthcare, we're now tapping into what's called uptodate.com. I don't know how many people here tap it. So if you're diagnosed with pneumonia, you go into UpToDate and it tells you a cookie cutter exactly what you need to do. And the issue is how much can you, should you deviate from that treatment protocol. And as we have seen patients in our specialty clinics refer to us by FQHC PCPs, we see a lot of variation in terms of why is this patient here at this stage. So there needs to be good agreement throughout this community as to what's the proper course of treatment for a given condition. Because as long as you don't have that, you'll see some waste and um, uh, variability. So I would say we definitely need to have uh, that um, knowledge where at the table as we define uh, things. Um, the last one that I would offer is the county leadership needs to be at the table. We've had huge success in Yolo County because the county leadership, in fact, uh, caused, chaired, and maintained the, the uh, inertia of what they call a safety net governance steering committee. And that's been phenomenal. Just having them at the table and keeping all of us going, that's been huge. Great, great. I don't know you have to leave, so again, would you all say, give you applause? You, you leaving now? You're going to stay? No, I'm going to call and cancel yeah, the other yeah. meeting? <laughs> 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 Thanks so much, Kevin. Uh, let's continue, Jim. Will you address that question? Oh, thank you. Um, I really think it's time for this community to put the full circle of the monetary equation uh, on the table. Um, the state needs to be involved. The health plans need to be involved. Uh, the hospital systems need to be involved. The independent physician associations need to be involved. Primary care providers need to be involved. The specialty care providers need to be involved. And the enabling service providers need to be involved. And they need to be involved in an open and honest discussion with the cost and revenue data that is now being played poker with um, on the table. Because there is no rational way to divvy up the federal tax dollar without being transparent at this entire circle. And I include the enabling services because this is where we <clears throat> start addressing moving from acute care treatment to preventative care and enabling a healthier community through wellness programs. So enabling services that heretofore have had no business model uh, need to be included in that circle, and we need to develop a business model for them. Good. Thanks. Robin? Um, well, I agree <coughs> with Jim. I'm, um, I'm not going to add to the types of people that need to be around the table. I, I will say two things, that there would be a lot of layers. There would be a lot of different, um, different expertise that needs to be around the table. But I think what's really important is that whoever is there is not there to protect their turf. I think you really have to be there and willing to look at the big picture and to be willing to collaborate for the good of all of our communities and for our patients. Um, and so I think that's, that's so extremely important because that is not an easy thing to do all the time. And the other thing too, um, just to build on what Claire said about the patient, is that as an FQHC, we have 51% um, of our board is consumers. And we learn a lot from our board members. And so I would say that there are very knowledgeable and articulate consumers out there who probably ought to also be at the table to, to, um, to balance what we, all of us as providers would, would be saying. Good. Carrie, you want to weigh in on that one? Um, you know, I, I don't think I have too, too much to add except for we talked about a lot of people being at the table and sometimes when you have too many people at the table, it becomes a point where you don't get a lot of stuff done. And I, um, so I think whoever is at the table not only needs to not protect their turf, but needs to be um, innovative, action oriented, and um, uh, needs to be streamlined so you don't get bogged down with needing to hear 50 different views and try to get something done at the same time. Ron, you want to comment on that? I wanted to add just one piece to that. 
I, I just find it terribly intriguing this morning I can go to Starbucks and use my phone and up in front I can order my coffee electronically, I can go to the airport and get scanned in electronically, and yet as a health system provider, I can have a test done in the office, but I can't see it in the hospital. I can have an imaging study. The, the cost that we waste in regard to the repetition, et cetera. So as we talk about this group, clearly we should have an integrated IT system expert that can tie these disparate systems together so that all of us mutually don't have to repeat and redo work that is inherently capturable with a single incident and we move on. Right. Dr. Palmer? So my answer is a little bit different than everybody else's answer. And it's based on the fact that, um, well, we all lament that we pay 16% of our GDP for healthcare in this country, which is twice as much as any other developed world. If you add up what we pay for healthcare with what we pay for social services, it actually comes out to the very average amount for developed countries. The total of healthcare plus social services is the same. It's just what we spend it on. So we spend it uh, downstream on healthcare instead of spending it upstream on social services, which will improve health. And I think those are the social service providers, some of those enabling services that you referred to, but also the school leaders, the NGO leaders, the government leaders, the um, experts on, on the economy, the experts on job programs, um, the expert urban planners on how we build our communities. So I think that as long as we talk to ourselves, we're not going to get to the fundamental redesign that I was referring to earlier. We need to broaden the scope of the way we think about health. Bobby, one way in The only other group that hasn't been mentioned, and it's not clear to me what role they could play, but I think about our health plans and, and how should they be involved as we redesign this. And I wouldn't disagree with uh, the other comments that were made, certainly individuals at the table, but um, if we, we can't get the health plans involved in how the, how the plans are designed, I, I think that it's going to be a constant friction and problems going forward. Let me just ask this broad question, and, and, and this time, you know, you can kind of jump in, whoever wants to go first. Um, you know, I really appreciate what you all have said about collaboration in the in the region and how well it's working in some places and, and identified some of the players who need to be involved. Um, so just a two, the second part of this question would be, where where can we use more collaboration and and how can we do it more effectively? I think there are groups all over the place. I think people are working together. And in some places, they're working really well together. So those could be some best practices, some examples of how we do it. But let's take, just take a minute and, and talk about where, where do we need more collaboration? How can we be, be more effective? Ron, you want to start that one? You would pick on the guy that started here a year ago. Because <laughs> you're still going to be real honest. <laughs> Uh, what I have seen in this community in comparison to the places that I have been before is a rich history of collaboration. I see a very strong working relationship. There was a study that I looked at uh, when I was looking at this job and they came back with a characterization of the Sacramento community as one built on fundamentally strong partnerships and cohesive working relationships. And I would say I agree with all of that. I think we go back to an earlier comment, I think we could use some help at the county or at the leadership level that there's an organizing group here that pulls our disparate interests together and keeps us focused on the same path. Yeah. Uh, I, I would agree. I think we've got some great examples of very strong partnership. Um, I can't say um, anything more positive about um, Sutter's relationship with the effort. I think they are fantastic. And we have many other partnerships, but we do some very, very innovative, creative things that are really uh, best practice. So I just have to highlight that again. I think Jonathan's out there. Um, if we can take that type of partnership and continue to just explode that and use that in so many different settings, I think there's more um, also that we can be doing on the IT side. There are examples of how that is done very well in other counties and other communities. Um, and right now, that is a lot of waste in the system. And again, it goes down to patients, patient first. 
always. If there is a patient who's coming into an emergency room at Kaiser but needs a specialty service at UC Davis or something at, at, at Sutter Health to not have things be repeated. We just don't have the infrastructure. So I think that is a non-turf, you know, issue that we could really get around and there's already demonstrated best practices out there we can just steal from. Thank you. Jim? Oh, this is my opportunity for a whole bunch of shout outs. <laughs> uh, it, it, there are so many good examples of uh, collaborations and the real issue is once you identify the right ones, how do you scale them and sustain them long term? Um, I noticed Jonathan nodding his head and I did, I looked at your hand to see if you had any tomatoes in them because you told me you were going to lob tomatoes at me if I used the phrase safety net. <laughs> and yet, this is where we're building the safety net. Oh, no. <laughs> Security. Um, um, this is where we're building uh, uh, a safety net. Um, examples, great examples. Um, Sutter and the effort and the T3 program. Uh, uh, helping patients establish medical homes. River City Medical Group and the hospital systems. Um, uh, ramping up case managers, registered nurses, to help, again, patients find access and um, establish medical homes and treat chronic diseases. Um, UC Davis Medical School supplying uh, young physicians and helping us grow our workforce and retain workforce with the effort and its day clinics, Clinica Tapita, Tapita? Tapati. Tapati, thank you, and Imani. Um, uh, Kaiser Permanente's uh, collaboration with Western Clinicians Network to create the clinician's library and decision support tool. Uh, the, this uh, collaboration will help really overextended physicians um, manage uh, mid-level providers in a more cohesive way, uh, establish clinical protocols for patient treatment, um, and perhaps even um, alleviate a little burnout and loss from the workforce. So this is a, another collaboration that Again, we have to figure out how to sustain and scale them. Good. Thanks, you have Dr. Palmer. Um, I would make two yeah. comments about potential areas of collaboration. First, um, I think we have to get better collaboration between our mental health services and our traditional medical services and, and, and mental health care delivery in this, in this community, particularly in Sacramento County, is at a crisis point and people are not getting the care that they need. So if we can't, we need, to, we must figure out how to collaborate um, with, with our colleagues uh, who are responsible for delivering mental health. The second area that I would identify is um, the opportunity to collaborate in more academic areas around education of the workforce and around research. And specifically, you know, at UC Davis, we're very proud of the fact that our most recent graduating class, we graduated 47% of the class chose primary care uh, training opportunities. That's one of the highest in the nation. But we need um, clinical rotation sites from our partners throughout the communities. The, the, the other hospital systems, the community-based clinics are ideal places, so can we collaborate there? And, and can we collaborate around um, clinical research? Why not have a Sacramento-wide clinical research network where we do all um, put data in and, and find answers about both best practices but new ways of doing things? I mean, I think there are real opportunities in there, and sometimes it, around education and research, it might be, there might be more comfort level for collaboration um, than around direct um, exchange of, of clinical services. So I would offer those possibilities to explore. Absolutely, thank you. Robin? Um, well, actually, I was going to talk a little bit about workforce development and then a little bit about a Yolo County example, but we, um, it's critically important that we train um, the, the coming generation or then actually the next couple of years of physicians and uh, nurse practitioners and PAs to want to work in the safety net, to want to work in community health centers 
and to want to work for this population. It's critically important. And so what we've done, we have a very, I mean, it goes back since the Davis Free Clinic days, we've had a relationship with UC Davis, UC Davis Medical Center, to train medical students and residents. And we're continuing to do that. We also train Sutter residents at our, our community clinics. And it's been wonderful because um, it doesn't happen all the time every year, but just enough we've influenced um, students and residents to want to go into community medicine. So we're very happy about that. And um, the other thing, I just wanted to, to use an example that we have in Yolo County about collaboration. And it was, we took a very specific problem. And we had the right people around the table. We had the commitment. We had funding from Kaiser, and it was our specialty care initiative. And because we defined this particular problem in Yolo County as access to specialty care for our, for our, uh, for our low income uninsured patients. So this is mostly about uninsured. And so um, we, when, when it was working, when it was really humming, we had everybody participating. We had really strong management. We had really strong case management. We Im improved access to specialty care. We reduced the no-show rate. We um, re re um, increased satisfaction by patients and by providers that provided the specialty care access. Um, but the sustainability of those kinds of projects, it's really what is difficult. Because if one provider <laughs> It doesn't want to do it anymore. It the, the whole system is pretty fragile; it can fall apart. So I just I just wanted to say that it takes not only the initial best practice, but the ability to sustain those best practices and this and uh, and with with the right partners. Good, thank you. Next question: uh, When you look at the data uh, from the market analysis and the st strategic plan, uh, one of the emphasis was on primary care coordination and integration as a key theme for improving healthcare in the region. So here's the question. If there were an agreement uh, that primary care in the region should be integrated, what needs to exist to make that a reality? Tim. It's a two-part answer for me. Um, first, uh, the information technologies that are being created now, that are being implemented, are creating a foundation, um, much like laying the roads uh, of the United States a century ago. Uh, we can't really tell what the effects are going to be, but they are going to be transformative and they're going to be tremendous. And we are just at the ground floor of that. As we um, implement, we will find ways to integrate once we've started the integration, we will reach a tipping point, and the benefits are unforeseen. They will be myriad. And so making sure that the health centers and the hospitals and the health plans have the ability to integrate uh, is going to be core to, the, to a transformation of the healthcare system and really integrating primary care with uh, other medical systems. Uh, the other part of my answer is we have to integrate, once again, those enabling services, those community-based organizations, and health educators, and other prevention-minded services uh, into the medical system and find sustainable business models for them. Because as we move from acute treatment to prevention, they are going to be an integral and integrated part of it. And at this point, they really aren't. They work at the fringes. They're often grant-funded, and their programs, um, as a result, don't get the follow-through that they deserve. Thanks, Jim. Um, Robin. Um, so I... I think, um, once again, we really need to focus on what we're calling, we're calling patient-centered health homes. And as we're, we're as uh, right now, we're going through the process, communities are going through the process of being, getting um, 
patient-centered health home recognition. And what, what we're really looking, what we're really <coughs> learning is how do we actually look at the healthcare system from the vantage point of the patient? What does that really, really mean and what does that really look like? And if, if we really are going to, going to be able to offer patient-centered care, it has to be integrated <coughs> because a patient wants a system that works for them that is convenient. I mean, actually, we all do. We're all, we're all consumers of health care. So I always think of myself, what, what would I, how would I, how do I want the system to work? Well, I want everybody talking to each other. I want to be able to get in when I want to. I want to see the doctor that, our nurse practitioner that I want to see. And um, I want to be able to get my results for myself. So we have, what we're looking at is those kinds of, um, we're looking at those, building those kinds of systems so that they really work for the patient and really actually um, electronic health records and, and HIE health information exchange is extremely important. We've talked about that a lot today. I know there's certain groups that are really trying to organize that throughout the, throughout the region. Uh -huh. It is critically important that we, uh, all of us as uh, providers can talk to each other and that the consumers can talk to their providers and get the information that they want. I think that's really important. Thank you. Ron. I agree with everything that's been said, and I'd want to put a, a maybe just a little clarification and caveat. I think the current way we incentivize and respect our primary care doctors has to change every bit as much as this transformation we're going through with financing the delivery plan. I think for too long we have told our young graduates you need to go into specialty to afford to feed your families. I think for too long we have held on a very high pedestal the individuals that go in and do cardiac surgery, and, and rightfully so. I'm not trying to denigrate any of those, but I don't think in the same regard we have held the primary care physician with that modicum of respect that needs to be there. I think number two, uh, and I heard a talk yesterday at Kaiser where the physicians now at Kaiser, because of the Kaiser Incentive Plan, have set aside time in the morning and they do telephone calls to patients, they do video calls to patients as opposed to needing to bring them in the office. And of course our current incentive system is, well there's no reimbursement for that. Well, that's goofy. Uh, you know, let's get to a point where we revamp that system so that if I'm a working mom or I am a new mother and I've got a baby at home and I've got issues with that and my primary care doctor can reach out to me via the Apple FaceTime and solve my problems, uh, we all use that technology. Why can't we get that technology within the primary care office? So I think, again, what I'm trying to say here is from a primary care standpoint, I'd like to see a institutional raising of the respect for primary care, and I think, number two, a transformation in terms of the incentive systems with which we reimburse those doctors to drive not a 47%, but maybe an 87% graduation rate for primary care. Well, certainly, Dr. Pomeroy at, uh, at UC Davis has just talked about a wonderful example of how they're already on the path to, to changing that. So I'll give you an opportunity right now, Doctor, jump in there. I know, I know you're just waiting. I, well, <laughs> of course. Um, <laughs> I want us to remember how difficult it can be for patients to navigate our systems, our primary care systems. And, and many of them don't even know where to begin. I mean, how do you get a primary care doctor? Where do you go when it's midnight and your kid has an earache? These, these are unfathomable things to people. And so I think we need to look at navigators and I think we have to understand that the solutions are not going to be the same for every member of our community. There are real cultural differences in how people are going to navigate through the primary care uh, system. One way, maybe technology for some, 
But you know, one of the risks of, of personal health records and emails and all of that is that you have a digital divide and you actually exacerbate health disparities if you become too dependent upon that. So we need to be thinking about that. We may understand that in the Asian community or the African American community or the Latino community, there may need to be different approaches to how you uh, effectively navigate around the system. We better learn cultural competency within our, our primary care systems or it won't be integrated from the point of view of the patient experience. Absolutely. Well, we have time for one more question. And fortunately, we only have one more. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we just talked about uh, the, the integration of primary care across the region and the value it has for the region. And, and, and we understand that there's some uh, some obstacles there and some hurdles to get through. But at least we've had a good dialogue around it. You couple this with the dialogue we've had over the last year about that same issue. Uh, certainly we have a lot of things that we can lay out to work on. Here's the question. If we are able to, uh, to truly integrate uh, primary care services across the region, then what would that mean for your organization? Let's start with you, Carrie. Um. Well, first off, I think the um, benefit to, um, I don't, I, it's actually uncomfortable to respond as a hospital because I think in, in or as part of Just Setter Health, I think the benefit is to the global community. So from that standpoint, you would have a base of true healthcare within the community. So I, I think from there comes everything else. And that's all about what we need to do, been trying to do, been talking about doing. And if the incentives are aligned, we've got physicians that are there wrapped around with mental health and social work and all of the other supportive structures around that primary care model, we'll actually have community health care. So probably not the answer typically. <laughs> Good answer. Your, that's your answer. We appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, we'll just flow down the room so, Bob, you can get ready to ditto it at the end. Uh, go ahead, uh, Ron. You know, I am blessed to work for Kaiser because I think to a large extent there's somewhat of a model in regard to that primary care already now. Having said that, one of the things that we consistently work on and see is the power of prevention and the power of that chronic disease management before it turns into chronic disease management. We're still seeing close to 75,000 people at the Morris Avenue campus. I would hope that if we reach a fully integrated model like we're talking about here with the hopes and dreams of aspirations that we have here, that we would see a drop in the utilizations of those emergency room and a push out to those primary care centers where that work is fundamentally better than the episodic work occurring in the emergency room. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Ron. Jim? A, a preface. Uh, the primary care clinics, especially the nonprofit primary care clinics, uh, need uh, some foundation laying after they have contracts with all of the health plans. After they which they don't. Uh, there's a huge uh, misallocation, if I may, to uh, for-profit clinics and health plan vertically integrated health centers and away from nonprofit clinics, which fundamentally strains their finances and will until they have access to health plans and that will occur. Um, once that happens, then w these nonprofit health centers will no longer need to struggle for existence uh, and they will be able to uh, seek to attain higher order solutions like better patient access, expanded services, preventative services, uh, be more and better collaborations with hospital systems. So integration will create for the nonprofit health centers an ability to seek higher order solutions than mere survival. Well said, Jim. Thank you. Dr. Pomeroy. Well, I agree with, with Carrie. I mean, if we really could integrate primary care system across our community, what it would do is get us to our mission of better health for all. And, and that is ultimately um, the right cause. 
Um, I, would, I would also say that it would hold the potential for us to look at ourselves as a community and say who um, and, and where and by whom um, do we deliver care so that we're delivering the right care in the right place at, at, at the right time. And you know, maybe each of these systems doesn't have to do everything Maybe we could come up with a system in our community in which we define um, the appropriate niches for each of, 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 of all of the systems and beyond that are, are, are represented here. And, and we said, well, we don't have to do it all. We can partner to do this part, and then we can specialize in this part. So I think it would lay a foundation for having a um, system that was integrated through all of the levels of care. The other thing I would say is if we could truly integrate primary care, we could start talking about things like using telemedicine to improve access. We could start talking about biosensors in people's homes. We could start talking about Skyping so by a nurse practitioner to do chronic disease management. I mean, these are the kind of innovations that would be possible if we had that foundation mm -hmm. of a true primary care system. Thank you, Robin. Well, at Communicare, we think we're the center of the universe. So we think that we actually have a pretty good, a pretty good model for primary care. We call, it, it's, we call it one stop shopping, where you walk into one of our health centers. And for, um, for, a primary, for primary care, you can have you know, general medicine, dental, perinatal services, uh, integrated behavioral health. I'm sure we're missing a few things. We, we can help you get on health insurance or, or health coverage. So we have a pretty good model of primary care. What in our, in our I think in our whole county, we have a, a couple of other FQHCs, but I, what we're very dependent on is specialty care access. Right now in the healthcare system throughout the region, there isn't enough access for specialty care today. So when you think of the growth that is going to be happening when all these, all these newly insured people are coming into primary care, and I feel confident, at least in Yolo County, that we're already planning for expansion and building capacity. So I feel fairly confident we will be able to meet that. But the specialty care is what I find that I, I find that it might be very difficult. We really need to think about this because we're, we're all talking about primary care, and that's right, we should, because that's where all care should start. We should keep people out of the emergency rooms, and we should have prevention, all of those things. But, but honestly, a sick person does need access to specialty care, and right now, today, we cannot get a lot of people in to, uh, for specialty care throughout the region. So we really need to think about that level of care and how we're gonna expand that and grow that capacity. Thanks, Robin. Bring us home, Bob. <laughs> Gary. Uh, <clears throat> CARE's uh, model is, is a, an integrated model of care and we're very proud of that. But I'd like to build on, again, just follow on what you know, kind of ditto what Robin said. It's not only access to that specialty care, but it's the delivering the results back to the primary care provider for delivery to the patient where we're very inefficient. And it goes back to um, uh, the integration of any sort of digital record system that CARES lacks for sure. And so it's very inefficient from the standpoint of if when we get someone into specialty care at a hospital system or, or some other clinic, just getting that results back delivered to the patient, it's a very inefficient way of doing business today. We could deliver much of the care inside of our four walls, but specialty care having to do with podiatry or you name it, it's not there. And then getting, the, getting in, getting the results back, getting it delivered, it's all about, you know, is Dr. Pomeroy and, we, we, and Robin talking about, it's about the patient experience too, having to wait several weeks and not getting the results of a test. And it, it does not make for a good patient result, you know, anxious as you will. I am, you would be. Help me thank this panel. Thank you.